A lot of the character of forging comes from a plane change like this, where it goes from vertical to horizontal. I'm going to make one of those now. I'll use the cross pin running across the axis of the copper that will squeeze the metal that way. There's no directional force coming this direction or this direction, so all the metal that's there is being pushed that way or that way. To minimize rolled over edge, I strike as close to the center as possible, and I'll work from both sides. And before the grooves get too deeply pushed down, I'll flip the hammer and smooth them out with the flat face of the hammer. What makes this shape so appealing is that a surface becomes an edge. And by the time you're there, you realize that you're in the middle of another form over here. So there's this kind of hypnotic blending of this element, which overlaps or splices into this element. To achieve that, I've hammered about two thirds of the way up the rod. Now I'll flip it over and do the same kind of hammering and run from here down to about here. Final finishing can then be done on the horn of the anvil. And there it is. Earlier we saw the way to file a point on wire. When using heavy stock, making a taper is best done with a hammer. The logic is pretty simple. I'll start up here and strike a series of blows with the cross pin across the axis of the wire. After going all the way to the end, I'll come back, but not quite as far up the length as I did before, and repeat the process, each time working on all four sides. The next time, I'll only come up to here, and then hammer that down. That means that a point here would be struck once, just on the first pass. A point, say, down here would be struck maybe five or six times, once on each successive pass. Because it's been hit more times, this area is smaller, and the result is a taper. You'll notice that it's going to grow in length. Uh, this sample was the same size as this before I started. It's very important that the wire be kept straight all the time. You see it has a little curve, so before I continue, I'll straighten that curve out. That's four sides all starting up here. Now I'm going to start about here. I'm working on copper, which is an extremely malleable metal, but even copper gets work hardened with this much stress. It's a bad time for me to stop and anneal it now. If I continue, not only is the work getting harder, but the edges are starting to crack. You might just begin to see it here. After annealing, remember to dry the piece thoroughly so you don't get any water on the anvil. As I get down to this thinner section, I need to use lighter blows. If I were to strike as strongly as I was at the beginning, I could possibly pinch right through. I'd certainly make the stock so rectangular, hitting it real hard here, that it would be hard to recover on this side. When the objective is a round taper, I go at it the same way by first creating a square and drawing the taper while it's square, and then turn it on an axis like that and strike down in the corner. Of course, what you're doing is flattening the corner you can see and also the corner directly opposite it. Flip it 90 degrees and hit the other two edges. The result of this is an octagonal section 
And from here, the piece can be simply turned and planished. All the work on a graceful piece like this one has been done with a hammer. And that's the idea of forging. Maybe this would work better as a pin if I put some pattern on it. I could use a hammer and punch. Probably the most direct way to texture metal is to strike it. In this example, assorted ball-peen hammers have been used. Here, a textured hammer face leaves its mark. A cross-peen offers many possibilities. Here I've used a scribe. Patterns can be found all around us. This texture was achieved by pounding the metal onto concrete. And here, by pounding onto cast iron. Another embellishment technique uses the rolling mill. The idea behind roll printing is really very basic. We're going to take a soft material. I'll demonstrate with a piece of clay. And any textured surface. Here I'll use some sanding film. Some kind of pressure is used to push these together. And when they're peeled apart, the texture has been imprinted or transferred onto the softer material. For our purposes, the source of the pressure will be the rolling mill. The rolling mill is a precise and expensive piece of equipment. Its primary use is to thin sheet metal, but it can also be used in patterning and in the reduction of wire. The rollers are of polished steel and require special care to remain smooth and parallel. They should be protected from moisture when not in use. Hardened steel should never come into contact with the rollers because it will scar them and knock them out of true. Let me illustrate this way. I'm going to take a piece of annealed sterling and some nylon gauze. The idea is to get this texture pressed into the sterling. Now I could shove it through the rolling mill like this and it would work. It would also do a number on the rollers. To prevent that, I'm going to protect them by adding to the sandwich this piece of brass. I choose brass because it's considerably tougher than sterling. In this way, all the push is going to be going into the sterling, making a clearer and therefore darker impression. I can set this in either side up. It doesn't make any difference in the result. Now I'll send this through and adjust the tension by trial and error until I get it to where it's difficult to roll through but doesn't require two people. You can see that the gauze, for one thing, has been pressed and can't be used again. The brass has very little surface texture and the sterling has a nice deep pattern etched into it. It shows up pretty well now. If I were to oxidize it, it would be even more highly contrasted. Let's see another example. In this case, I've got a template which I've made by piercing a sheet of brass. I'll be using polished sterling, which is of course annealed, and regular Kleenex. Sandwich goes together like before. And there's the template, the paper, which is heavily stressed. And look at that. What you'll see is that the polished sterling was able to remain polished where it crossed over the star. In other words, there was nothing pressing on it when it was in that open spot. In between the stars, the paper was pressed into the sterling and it gives this wonderful, rich, sandblasted look. <laughs>